Let's talk a little bit more about scientific publications. This is a good place to understand what happens well before you turn on the news and you hear somebody say, scientists have discovered that, blah, blah, blah. It's not as if a scientist all of a sudden has a eureka moment and shouts it out to the world and the news picks it up. There's a lot that comes before the you know, local media picking up on some scientific um, discovery. So when you're, let's say, uh, you're a postdoc in a lab and you have this research project and you've been working on it maybe for a year, two, three, six years, and you finally have a really good story. You have your question, you have your hypotheses, you have data to support those hypotheses, you can make good conclusions, you're ready to package it, and you're ready to publish it, you're ready to have other scientists in your field and throughout different fields read your work um, and see what they think. So what you do is you sit down and you start writing. And it takes a long time to write a paper, to put together all of the figures, put together all your statistical analyses, put together all your references. Once you have that package, then you have to pick a journal. Now, science journals, they have a hierarchy. There are the really, really good journals, top notch, and then there are journals all the way down to the bottom. And they're ranked based on how good the science is that actually is accepted into these journals. So your top journals are going to be things like Science and Nature and Cell. Now, if you can publish in any one of those, you are golden for, for finding a, a job or having your own lab then to, to work in and to manage. Now, so you've got your, your article. You've written it. You're ready to get it published. You're going to pick the top journal that you think your paper could potentially be published in. You send it to the editor. And the editor of that journal is going to read it. And when they read it, they can do one of two things. They can either say, nope, sorry. Um, this is not the material that our readers are interested in, or it's not of the caliber. The science is not of the caliber that we publish in this journal. Please try elsewhere. In that case, you'll have to pick another journal. On the other hand, if the editor says, you know, this is pretty good. I think, I think we have something to work with here. Let me send it out for a review. And they will take your story, all this hard work that you put into writing up this journal article, and they're going to send it to the experts in your field. These are people that are PIs that know everything in your field that there is to know. So then they send your paper to these individuals and they read it. And the reviewers will give you comments back. And literally they pick apart your article to pieces. They will tell you everything, hopefully that's right, but also everything that's wrong with your paper. They'll tell you that you're missing controls. They'll tell you um, that your statistical analyses are incorrect. They will tell you, hey, have you thought about this conclusion as opposed to this conclusion? They check your work, right? And they'll send their comments back to the editor. The editor will look at it and say, ugh, there's way too much that needs to be corrected here. I don't think that we are ready to publish something like this. So then you have to think, do I want to fix it up and try again? Am I going to try a different journal? You have some decisions to make. Hopefully, though, what the editor will do is we'll say, okay, here are the edits from the reviewers. Um, I think we can work with this. Go ahead and make the corrections, make the adjustments that the reviewers suggested, and then submit it back to us, and we will go ahead and publish it in our journal. You have three months. Go. Mind you, you've been working on this for six years. Completing all those extra experiments and revising and redoing your statistical analyses in six months is like asking somebody to do something in a millisecond. But that's okay. You're going to pit, put your you know, big girl, big boy pants on and you're going to get that work done. You're going to polish it. You're going to revise it. You're going to submit it. And you're going to get it published. So the reason why I tell you this is that the scientific journal articles that are published in peer-reviewed journals, we don't get to publish whatever we want. We go through as science as a scientific community, we go through a system of checks and balances to make sure that we believe in our work and other scientists also believe in our work. Oftentimes these scientists might be our colleagues, might be our competitors, right? But if more people believe and stand behind that work, then we have more confidence then to get it out to the broader community um, and, and share our science with, with everybody. Um, so, as I mentioned, scientists definitely check each other's claims before performing similar experiments. You might be working on something very similar to what somebody has already published. You say, ooh, that looks really good, but you know what? 
I don't trust them. I think I'm going to go through those same experiments to make sure they work in my hands too before I build on it. And so not only before an article is published do we check each other's work, but also well after. Um, and sometimes if an experiment can't be repeatable, the original claim might have to be revised. And we're all human, right? And it might be a difference like... Um, you added one substance to the buffer, whereas somebody else added a slightly different variation of that molecule to the buffer, and that did something completely different in a living system. And nobody's wrong in this case, but maybe some clarification needs to be added to um, the original already published journal. And so oftentimes there are edits that are published after the fact. Um, it is also not unusual for different scientists to work on the same research question. This is good and bad at the same time, right? The more people that are working on a question means it's really important to the scientific community and maybe to the world at large. Um, and the more heads you have working on the same thing, the quicker we're going to get to being able to answer some of those scientific questions. But that also means that scientists, they definitely butt heads sometimes. Um, and if somebody publishes the project you're working on before you get a chance to publish it, nobody's going to want to publish your work anymore because it's already out there. And what we say in the scientific community is you've been scooped. And so you don't ever want to be scooped. So oftentimes what scientists will do is they will collaborate. And they'll say, hey, your lab is working on this. My lab is working on a very similar thing. Why don't we put all of our heads together, work on it together, published together, and then everybody gets credit for the work that they've done. Scientists are also oftentimes forced to cooperate. Um, so you'll notice through your textbook or maybe reading scientific articles that we don't oftentimes perform scientific experiments on humans, right? We often have model organisms, things like fruit flies or Drosophila melanogaster, worms, frogs, mice, rats, rabbits. There are a lot of different model organisms that scientists work with. And if you create a model organism, let's say a mouse that mimics a certain human disease, so you can study that human disease in that mouse model, and the money that was used to create that mouse model came from a government grant, you are required to share your mouse model with whoever wants it. So for example, as a graduate student, I made a mutation in a mouse line. A mutated part of a protein that functions in the brain. I want to see, well, what does that protein do? How does it affect brain function like learning and memory? When I made that mouse model, I, the money that was used to pay me my salary and to buy all the supplies and equipment needed to conduct that experiment came from a, gov a government grant. And so um, once that mouse model was created, if anybody, you know, read my paper and called us up and said, oh, that mouse model is great, we want it, we'd have to share those animals with those other labs. Um, and so mice are really common in terms of being great um, model organisms, but like I said, they're not the only ones. Geneticists, for example, love to use fruit flies or Drosophila melanogaster. Um, this is because their genome is fairly small. They only have eight chromosomes. It's very easy to manipulate, uh, and fruit flies breed like crazy, and so you get a lot of data in a short period of time. The other thing I love about uh, Fruit fly geneticists is that they have a sense of humor, which sometimes is hard to come by uh, in science. Uh, so, for example, if you discover a new gene, you get to name it. How cool is that? Well, scientists who discover genes in mice or humans, they're kind of boring when they come up with their names. But if you're a fruit fly geneticist, I think there's code in there somewhere that you have to come up with something pretty creative for your gene name. So for example, there are genes uh, in fruit flies that are called bazooka and um, hedgehog, Cleopatra. My favorite one is Icarus. If you know anything about mythology and the story of Icarus, Icarus and his, and his dad were trying to escape and they built these wings out of feathers and wax. Dad says, hey, Icarus, don't fly too close to the sun when we're trying to escape because the wax will melt and your wings are going to fall apart and you're going to fall to your death. Icarus, of course, doesn't listen and falls to his death when he flows, uh, flies too close to the sun. And so when you mutate this Icarus gene in fruit flies, that causes a disruption in the way that the wings grow and they develop these big blisters, kind of like what you would imagine might happen if you got a little too close to the sun and the, and the uh, flies can't fly very well. All right. 
Um, moving along in our discussion of the scientific process. So once you're working in a field and you have a whole bunch of hypotheses that start to build on a central idea, really what you're working on is a theory. Um, and so, you know, when we use the term theory in everyday language, it's kind of like a guess, right? Oh, I have a theory about this. Well, in science, a theory is a little bit different, um, larger and a little more concrete. So a theory is typically broader in scope than a hypothesis. It's really general and it can lead to new and testable hypotheses. And it's going to be supported by a very large body of evidence in comparison to hypothesis, right? Hypothesis can be supported maybe by an experiment, one set of data, a graph, right? That's it. But a theory is going to be supported by many scientists' work, many experiments that have gone in, sort of build onto this mountain that is a theory. You've heard of theories before, theory of relativity, theory of gravity, theory of evolution, these are all theories that, again, they have a lot of sub-hypotheses and a lot of little experiments that have built onto this broader um, idea in science. Now, when we come back to this term science, right, oftentimes you hear on uh, the news, science, you hear technology, um, and maybe in everyday language these two might be, these two terms, science and technology, could somewhat be used interchangeably, but they are actually quite different. The goal of science really is to understand natural phenomena. Everything's already out there, we are just trying to understand what is already out there. Whereas the goal of technology is to apply our scientific knowledge for some specific purpose. Yes, these two, science and technology, are interdependent, right? Um, but to separate the two, you can think of biology as being marked by discoveries, right? You're discovering what's already out there, whereas technology is marked by inventions. You're creating something completely new that did not exist before. And this combination of science and technology has had really dramatic effects on society, right? One tends to advance the other. So, for example, when um, we put together the first microscopes, um, we were able to see that we are actually made out of individual living units that are called cells. And when we could see that, we learned more about the way that multicellular organisms are put together. We learned more about the fact that unicellular organisms exist, and this is what makes us sick, like bacteria. Um, and that led us to developing even better microscopes, like electron microscopes that allow us to see things even smaller than bacterial cells, like viruses, for example. Um, and so the more we learn about the viruses or the bacterial cells, the better we can understand, well, how can we treat bacterial viral infections? And so it's kind of, you know, a, a back and forth. Science advances technology, technology advances science, which again advances technology and so forth.